or do the cloud. Okay. Some examples of how I use GIS in my practice so that you can sort of, the thing with GIS is that if you can think it, you can do it in GIS. Seriously. <laughs> uh, the, it's very powerful. It's really um, it's a very powerful tool, and so as long as you're aware of the possibilities or you know a process that you have in your mind, um, as long as you have access to someone like me or Esri product, you know, online tutorials, there's a way to do whatever you might want to do. <laughs> so the possibilities are unlimited. Just, just know that. Um, so I wanted to show you just a few examples at different scales. Um, I like to talk about our tools as designers as sort of big tools and small tools, not necessarily coinciding with the scale that you use the tools, even though there is um, some applicability to that uh, way of thinking. But I consider GIS this sort of big tool. And then, you know, in an era of big data, as you all read about um, with Milburn's um, article, hopefully, um, in landscape and urban planning, um, you know, we have we are just inundated with um, information out there and GIS is very helpful for us to sort of synthesize things in a very fast way um, whereas um, in the past um, that data would have been either non-existent or too overwhelming to process but now we have these great powerful computers uh, which is really exciting um, so we'll be focusing you know on this big tool GIS um, and here's the quote again from from Ian McCarg that I think um, is really important. This is adding a second line that um, that this is the prerequisite for intelligent intervention and adaptation. And I think that was echoed by Dangerman in his article in the blog of um, how uh, given today's um, uh, challenges with climate resiliency, um, population growth, um, disproportion of resources, so many um, challenges with the present world that um, something like GIS can really help us um, do what I would say intelligent tinkering, which is sort of an out of uh, Leopold uh, quote as well. So we're doing intelligent tinkering. <laughs> so I'm just going to start with some uh, project examples at the regional scale, um, which really focus on place-based solutions. Uh, and the ones that I'm going to focus on are some stormwater projects that I've worked on. Um, so the way that you treat stormwater or how you might do it at a city scale or a site scale, you can't do this, you can't um, sort of manage um, stormwater sustainably the same in Philadelphia as you would in Los Angeles. Um, and so it's really important that you understand the hydrogeology first and foremost of where you are, the climate, there are all these sort of environmental uh, um, attributes that you need to understand about a site to then inform a solution. So we worked with the city of Chattanooga, again, it's, we're looking at a really big scale here, um, to do some green infrastructure planning, uh, which was very reliant on, on GIS um, tools to help um, sort of guide through how they might change their rules and regulations, but also where they might target investment in green infrastructure um, development throughout the city of Chattanooga. Oops. And as you all know, um, hopefully you know a little bit about Chattanooga and that it is very, um, it's sort of, its culture and its identity are really tied to the, to the river here. Uh, and it's a really, water quality is really important to them, not just environmentally, but also culturally. Uh, so for green infrastructure planning, um, there are all these different things that contribute to um, healthy water systems that you have to take into account, especially when you're changing your policy or both the municipal level that can work together to find these synergies and other issues that you might have at a municipal level. Um, so the EPA has this, um, uh, what is it called? It's called the EPA scorecard. It sort of outlines this critical path for evaluating the existing resources you have with your city and then helps you sort of plan for green infrastructure. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about that and we'll have an exercise that's tied to green infrastructure planning later. Um, but all of these things are important aspects that contribute to healthy um, water systems that affect code. And so from these um, sort of buckets of different 
tasks like efficient parking and contract development or even um, equitable open space. There are sort of GIS processes where you can sort of synthesize all the data of a city uh, to begin to help you understand um, what are your critical resources that need to be conserved. Um, and this is sort of an ugly diagram, but not only what are the, the resources that need to be conserved, but how might you um, identify priorities for where you invest uh, taxpayer money and in installing these in infrastructure systems, not just where it makes sense from a hydrological standpoint, but where it might make sense uh, for people, underserved groups um, that may not have um, access to high quality open space. And so GIS is just a really important part of the process. And so this kind of mapping of okay, what are the what are the characters or what are the types that I need of data that I need to sort of solve this spatial problem are really important to, you know, they're, they look kind of nerdy and, and weird, but uh, you really have to sort of map out what your approach is and formulate um, a, a process before you sort of dive into these larger scale planning efforts. And so these are kind of older. We did these maps probably about eight or 10 years ago, so they're not as sophisticated as the maps that we've seen you guys are going to produce. Um, but some of the outputs of it, uh, of the work that we did with the city of Chattanooga is, is sort of targeting sort of flood mitigation projects for the next 20 years in the city. Um, and then also identify areas for investment. Again, married, uh, marrying um, need in the community for open space, but also marrying the environmental characteristics that make the geology, the soil, um, the land cover types, uh, sort of low-hanging fruit for the most bang for your buck for treating and managing soil. Um, another project that's sort of stepping down in scale is a 6,800-acre ranch that I worked on um, in Austin, Texas, which those who have been in my class um, have, talked, have heard about this project before. Uh, but this is a conservation land that, again, is tied to sort of water quality um, that this one family owns. It was really dedicated to conservation. Uh, they had two endangered bird species on uh, the land, uh, but they wanted to really share this um, land with um, the public. And so they wanted to do a retreat center, a visitor center, a camp for children and um, underserved youth in downtown Austin, uh, and had all these sort of programmatic ideas that they wanted to, to, to embed on the ranch to, to help share the ranch with the greater public, but they didn't want to develop it in a way that um, would detriment the existing resources of the site. So we worked, um, this is just the 6,800 acres. You can see Barton Creek, uh, which goes to Barton Springs, if, if you all are familiar with that, in downtown um, Austin, where they do like Austin City Limits Festival, uh, sort of a popular place um, where this eventually goes to. Um, but this this sort of chunk of, of land is really, really critical for the water quality protection of all the city of Austin. Um, so you can see just sort of the vastness and all the water bodies um, that go through the site. And so we did a master plan for this group, um, for this family, it was a two genera or three generations of family. They really started with inventory analysis, opportunities and constraints that then um, fell into management guidelines. But again, some of the processes of, okay, where do we build? Where do we not build? Where do we um, limit um, certain types? of use versus where can we really get, um, uh, where should we concentrate, you know, uh, impervious services, um, understanding how the land works. I mean, really sort of relied on first understanding where the, the high quality natural resources are. So again, that gets into sort of out, trying to figure out, okay, where are those, where are those high quality habitat areas, where are those um, soils that need to be protected, where are the water bodies, that are connected to groundwater systems that need to protect it, and then things like no development zones um, enforced by the city, but also the conservation movement we have. How do all these things add up to tell us where the best place is to build things or protect things or restore things? Same thing with cultural systems. Uh, they had a lot of historic properties on the site. So um, where are those known um, and potential prehistoric archaeological sites? Where are some of the cultural landscape features? Um, that we might want to protect. And that also includes view sheds and soundscapes, just experiential aspects of the land that can be mapped 
and added together to give you this, this, this idea of where should we um, protect the cultural resources um, and play out different scenarios as well uh, with development. And understanding um, what to do on the site really had to zoom out. Um, this was done in GIS, <laughs> but this is just a map showing the ranch right here in the middle. And, um, and there's a, the 98th Meridian is what separates East Texas from West Texas. But what's really important about understanding that is that this is where you transition from uh, East Texas, where you get just dumped, get dumped on with storm water and hurricanes, and very wet, um, you know, 40 inches of annual rainfall, not too far away from um, Shield Ranch. However, on the west side, when you start going out west, this is the transition to the desert. Um, so you can add anywhere from 26 inches of rainfall. So that's a huge difference. So understanding that context, that the ranch sort of lies at what they call this hot spot of climate resiliency, where um, you know they could have these swings of huge rain events that you would get typically in these types of the huge droughts. So that's so important in planning as well. Again, these are just some ways for us to understand the context of a place. Um, this is the shield ranch right here. These are land cover maps that you can download from uh, GIS just to understand how things are changing over time. Uh, these are now um, very easily accessible on Art Pro. You can just upload them directly, uh, which is kind of nice. But you can see these are land cover types taken from satellite um, imagery where you have the red and the pinks that are impervious surfaces, developed areas, and then you have blue, which are water bodies, and then you have sort of scrubby brown, um, lower vegetation, land cover types. Uh, and this is really important to see how uh, things have changed over time or what is within the context of your site or within the watershed that you're operating within. Um, this was from a little backwards. Yeah, you can see here, this is, um, this is back, the, the label is wrong, but I think this was like 2004, 2005. Um, and then if you go to 2016, you can see how much Austin has grown in the next last 10 years. Um, and you can actually, because these are raster images, you can actually uh, do, they can use math to see what those differences are uh, mathematically between those years. Um, but visually, I think it's also a powerful tool to communicate um, changes over time. Um, this is us sort of understanding the proportion of Shield Ranch and its watershed, um, which I think is also a, very, a really quick thing that you can do in GIS. So this is the watershed boundary of uh, Barton Springs, which is down here where they do Austin City Limits Festival. This is Barton Creek. But you can see just the sheer size in relation to the actual watershed, um, and that one land holder can have an influence on the water quality of that area. And look at, these are all the green spaces, the preserved open spaces, and Shield Ranch is probably one of the biggest ones I mean, it's privately owned. So that's also sort of an important lesson um, or thing that you can do. Um, another technology that we've been using a lot with GIS is drone, um, drone technology, not just for imagery like this, but now drones can do LIDAR, take um, LIDAR data. Do you all know what LIDAR is? Okay. Okay, well, I'll explain it. Okay, so it's all about laser beams. <laughs> so traditionally, um, particularly back in the day, you know, planes, especially in coastal states, um, really needed updated elevation data um, so that they can understand how flood plains were changing, especially for FEMA. So there was a huge push, like when North Carolina was a coast, is a coastal state and was a part of this process, and, um, but to have, um, to, to basically apply planes that have basically these lasers that send um, a beam down, and I'm simplifying, this is like Star Trek, um, that send a laser down um, that can be tweaked to either, um, so they measure the time of return from when the, 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 the beam or the laser goes, hits something and then comes back up, and that can give them a sense of the elevation. So when they do that, they can actually tweak it to get the elevation of the earth, they can use it to now get the elevation of vegetation. 
they can now use it to get the elevation of buildings. And so what we now have um, these things that are called point clouds, which are these 3D points of uh, real life <laughs> of all these um, returned lasers um, that give us a sense of three-dimensional space without actually going through the space. <laughs> so when, when you get that laser that return, um, you get X, Y, so latitude, longitude, but also Z values. Every point has all that data. And so back in the day, they would do that like every 10 meters or every 20 meters or every 30 meters. In Texas, at down North Carolina, they do it every 13 centimeters. So this is some really powerful data that we used for this site um, to understand the, because it's such a vast site, we couldn't do field collection on 6,800 acres within a year time period for the master plan. It's very powerful data that I'm going to teach you guys how to use. Um, and that's why I'm excited about um, GIS, uh, Art GIS Pro, is when we get into the 3D aspect of it, we can begin to see these things in 3D and really understand space really quickly. The reason why I'm saying that is that before the government would fly planes to do this, but now with drone technology, they can actually give you LIDAR data, and it's actually pretty common now on drones um, to have that capability. Um, so, which means you'll be, you might be working with a, a, a surveyor when you're out in the professional world that can do that, and then they'll be giving you that raw data, and then you can put it into Rhino, you can put it into GIS, you can put it into AutoCAD, whatever 3D program you might be using um, to, to cut sections, to understand vegetation. I mean, just a lot you can do with it. Did I explain, did that make sense? Lasers. <laughs> <laughs> so we were able to do that um, shield rate, um, and also get beautiful photography of, of um, site. I wish that NC State had um, a drone that you could check out, but I guess that would be really dangerous to let us fly drones without any training. <laughs> um, but it'd be great if you like rent a drone and a pilot for a day. Um, so anyway, uh, maybe one day, but I don't think we have that capability right now. Um, the other thing that's really important part of our process is looking at historical photography. Um, and one of the workshops that you sign up for, um, and this was another era of comedy of errors, uh, is that those workshops, two of those workshops coincide with our class. <laughs> and the dates were different on, on the initial page versus when you clicked on it. So I, it's not all me just being completely flaky. <laughs> Even though the one was like six in the morning, I was like, oh, they can figure it out. I don't know. <laughs> if you're not able, I know Ben was one of them. If you're not able to make the one that is not during class time, just let me know. It's not a big deal. But I would like for you all to do, to go attend that workshop. I think it'll be really fun. Um, and have, you'll have a different perspective than from my perspective on how to tell a story with GIS or um, georeference historic maps like in this case. So sometimes we get these old um, aerial photographs that we can then bring into GIS and georeference them and track changes over time or just be able to layer um, new, um, you know, new roads to see um, where they were, where they are now versus where they weren't on these historical imagery. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. The other great thing about NC State is that you have access to Sanborn maps. Have you guys heard of Sanborn? They're fire insurance maps. Um, which seem really boring and not useful, but they're the only sort of consistent map cartographer, um, cartography system of, um, in the past. Um, I think even starting maybe in the 20s or even the 1800, late 1800s to get old historic maps of places. Usually they're only um, constrained to like downtown areas. So I did like if you're, looking at a project maybe out near 540 from North Raleigh, you might not be able to find a Sanborn map for that. Um, but, you know, within the, the um, uh, downtown area or within 440, you might be able to find those. Um, but that's a free thing that you can have through NC State, which is not free if you're a professional. Uh, and so this is talking about LIDAR data. This is just a raw uh, digital elevation model of Shield Ranch that you get. So these are all those laser beams <laughs> uh, put into points 
and then put into a made into a raster image. So it's going from a sort of a vector type um, to a raster, uh, which is really great. And you can do so many fun things with these great digital elevation models um, that I'm going to show you how to use. You can create hill shades, which I don't typically use hill shades um, just by themselves. But if you can imagine doing an overlay with some transparency, with some color, um, these show really the depth um, and the shadows of the of how the, the physiography or the, the land forms of the site. Um, more, I mean, you can see a lot of little details here of how things are cut, uh, which I think is really interesting. Uh, and so this is what I talk about. I wouldn't normally use it as just by itself, but if you overlay an elevation map that separates high elevations from low elevations with different colors, give it a little transparency, and then all of a sudden, it's really clear about where the high areas are, the mid areas, and then the low areas. And so this is some of the process. Um, I'll just make this available so you can see it. I don't expect for you to read it, but with this new LIDAR data, with the point cloud data, which is now, since we have stronger computers back in the day, you couldn't, it would kill your computer if you tried to do this. But you can cut sections. Um, so you can see here, this is over like probably 100 acres of a section. So it's not maybe less than that, but it's a really big area. Uh, can you imagine trying to do that by hand in CAD? <laughs> uh, so you can cut sections and get topography and vegetation. Um, and now there are ways that you can take an aerial photograph, um, at least in plan view, or no, um, you can take, they actually have photographs of, um, I'm not sure how you do it exactly, but you can actually overlay a photograph on these so that they look more realistic and not just so I'm going to teach you guys how to do all that. So you can see here, I mean, it's not, um, this is a really rough version um, of ways that you can cut big, really big sections, um, but we'll try to do some more smaller scale, more detailed um, uh, studies to do that. Um, the other thing you can do with hill shade and elevation data is get slope aspect. So are your slopes facing north? Are your slopes facing south? Are they facing east? Are they west? Are they flat? Uh, sorry, I don't have a legend on here. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, but the the blue or the dark areas are either east or north facing slopes, and then the light colored oranges and yellows are south um, or west. And the important, um, there's a lot of reasons why you might want this, especially if you do, I do a lot of restoration planting. So you might have a different plant palette or plant community on north facing or east facing slopes versus south facing um, or west facing slopes. There's a lot of different um, other things that you might do, we've used hill shade, um, I'm sorry, slope aspect for our siting of passive, uh, passive thermal um, architecture that may take, you know, maybe may light on the land or have passive um, sort of technologies for dealing with the heating and cooling of the building or also photovoltaics. Mm -hmm. So you probably don't want to put, you know, if you're looking at a site this big, you might want to focus those um, sort of green buildings on the, the west or the south facing slopes rather than the north facing slopes if you want to maximize your energy production. And then these are just some of the synthesis, the layer cake method that you all re re read about, the in the car sort of method, and then later uh, science uh, method of layering in suitabilities of soil, water, elevation, whatever those things are that you decide. Layer caking them, adding them all together, um, using a raster calculator in GIS to get different suitabilities for different purposes. Um, so this one here is specifically for uh, where are the really critical places um, for uh, building that won't compromise the integrity of the um, ecological, hydrological system. So you can see this light blue area is where development um, is least impactful on, on the water resources of, of the site. Um, and then there's, you'll, for our watershed folks, we're going to, um, I took a course in Arc Hydro, so I'm going to make sure that you know how to use Arc Hydro, which uh, basically takes um, data from LIDAR, uh, any elevation data, and it basically does this. Um, it, it looks um, at any pixel point, and it says, hey, the pixel above you, are you lower than me? 
or are you higher than me? It pixeled to the right. Are you lower? Are you higher than me? You, and it goes around and asks that question. And then it knows because of that, which way water will flow. So it can do that for thousands and thousands and thousands of pixels. So what you get are drainage lines that aren't from the USGS. They're your own drainage lines based on the surface and how water moves. You can get ridge lines really quickly. You can get watersheds, um, drainage areas. Um, and you can even say, uh, with our hydro, you can pick a point on a map and say, what, are, what is the upland watershed at this point? And it will delineate it for you on the plot. So pretty powerful watershed stuff. And then from that, you can do hydrological modeling. Not that we're civil engineers, but there are really quick ways that we can do really basic um, stormwater calculations if that floats your boat. <laughs> Uh, and then we can't forget about the human experiences of the landscape. So something that uh, I just, um, we're writing an article for Landscape Architecture Magazine right now, um, and I was just interviewed for it, um, is soundscape mapping. Uh, so I've been, uh, and hopefully I'll be publishing soon on our process for how you do that. Um, but trying to map the quiet spaces and the, the really loud spaces, not only on how, how the experience or what the landscape is today, but playing out different development scenarios off your property or on your property to see how that influences things like soundscape, but also view shed. Uh, the great thing about um, the 3D capability of GIS is that you can say, okay, I'm here and put a dot over on the tennis courts at Poland Park, and they can say, what can you see um, if you were, can you see that tennis court if you were standing here and there was no vegetation? Um, if I put a 30 foot building, if I, you're standing here, can I see that? And you can quickly do these uh, view shed analyses um, with different development scenarios fairly rapidly. And so what we did for um, Shield Ranch was do a lot of those to identify these overlapping areas where you could um, they're very visible or they're really critical to the experience of the place that you should and then protect those areas um, and teach you how to do that too. Uh, and all of this sort of helps, um, I won't get into the nitty gritty, do design guidelines for how you might manage water depending on where you are on the site. There's a lot of science behind this, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but only, you know, where do we place programming is the, sort of the end goal of, of that master plan project. But it also helped us to um, propose sustainable infrastructure scenarios or processes. Uh, this client wanted net zero water, um, so they wanted to capture all the water that they use on site for use, but they also didn't want to have any wastewater. So depending on the hydrology, the geology, the slopes, what uh, a whole magnitude of things, uh, that determined whether we did composting bullets or whether we did solar um, energy or whether we needed to actually use um, this new system, which is taking water out of the, the air and using that for drinking water, uh, so sort of an um, atmospheric water condensation system. So all of that mapping that I just showed you uh, sort of ended and, you know, where do you put the programming? Um, and how do you have sustainable strategies depending on where you are? Um, and then, of course, 3D capability. And I'm going to quickly go through master planning scale. So, we're going to step down in scale to something a little bit smaller. Uh, this is a university outside of Pittsburgh um, where this really basic um, uh, master planning thing that you may do on any of your projects. This is sort of the end master plan. Uh, it's an ag it's to be an agricultural sort of campus for Chatham University, so it's a little outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, but again, they wanted net zero energy, net zero water, but they also wanted to make sure they cited all their agricultural systems in the best way. Um, so this is a master plan. Uh, but to get there, you know, there's a lot of GIS work that that got us to that point. Understanding where we want to do the watershed. Um, understanding where the water bodies or even the smallest little drainage areas are and their associated floodplains. And, um, you know, looking at um, where the existing structures are and getting those as a part of the GIS database. Um, and then proposing um, buffer strategies to protect the integrity of all these drainage lines. So using the buffer pool in GIS off of the waterway to make sure to protect it and use it um, a 300 foot uh, buffer in some areas. 
Um, and then that then sort of guided where you could develop, where we couldn't develop, where trails might go, things of that nature. Um, and so if you all, that's just sort of a typical master planning process that you might go through like your studio. And then at the site scale, um, some people may not think that you can, GIS is a useful tool at you know, a couple acre site. Um, this is not really a couple acre site. But I will say at the University of Pennsylvania at Shoemaker Green, we use GIS um, to, uh, as a part of our process. It's a 2.75 acre site, and it was a sustainable sites pilot project. So 2009, when the sustainable sites initiative was getting started. But we used GIS to quantify all the materials on the site for recycling, um, and also balance cut and fill, um, and a lot of things. So don't let anyone tell you that GIS is inapplicable to a small site. Um, we used it as a very pow powerful tool for that project. And then later, post-occupancy, we used GIS with the environmental psychology students to do behavior mapping um, and understand how people use the site and how the, the actual design sort of informed or did how people and why people use the site in different ways. So don't let anyone tell you that. Uh, I just wanted to quickly show uh, the Coast Guard headquarters, which is in Washington, D.C., which was on much like Dorothea Dix campus, an old abandoned um, insane asylum. I don't know. This is like the third one our firm worked on. I don't know what it says about us. Um, it has some, um, so the Department of Homeland Security uh, wanted to consolidate. This is right after 9 11. Uh, well, not right after 9 11. Well, yeah, it was. They wanted to consolidate. This, now I feel old because you guys are probably like, I don't even know how old you were in 9 11, <laughs> 2001. But anyway, um, uh, so they wanted to bring Coast Guard, FEMA, Department of Homeland Security into one campus. They're going to spread out in all these crappy uh, office parks across or office parks, office buildings in, in Washington, D.C. with their windows. So they're going to bring it to this campus, but it's also a historic resource. There's a Civil War camp here. Um, it has a lot of historic integrity. Uh, there's also whoops, a bald eagle nesting here, which came with its own constraints. Uh, but they wanted, so we did an ecological master plan uh, for where, how they would build out over the last, next 16 years, which was about, it was billions of square footage of new office space or renovated office space in the existing buildings. So we used GIS to do a lot, a lot of really cool things. Um, this was our plan for um, uh, restoration of the existing historic structures and then the new Coast Guard headquarters, which were to be tucked into the hillside not compromise the view from the, the basin, the swamp of Washington, D.C. up on that, what they call the Green Bowl that surrounds Washington, D.C., which is a historic sort of um, reference point that's very important. Um, so we did a lot of field assessments with the ecological systems, the soil, the hydrology, the trees collecting data with GPS, um, and then bringing all of that into um, GIS to do these different assessments of what was good quality, what was bad quality, to help guide restoration strategies, uh, where we might want to build new buildings, or what we might want to protect moving forward. Um, and then also doing, um, you know, just trying to understand um, mostly utilities and routing. So we use GIS to do a lot of utility routing scenarios away from the high quality um, really old trees on the property because they were actually tied to the um, historic integrity of the site and had to be protected. So we did all these scenarios to say, okay, we're gonna run, and you can imagine the Department of Homeland Security, what our utility uh, tunnel was, is, it's bigger than this room that had to go through the campus. So trying to make sure that we did all these different scenarios that stayed away from those high quality trees. And from that come, all that sort of comes together to give you site protection areas which are in dark green or go areas where you can go um, or do whatever you want. Um, but also understanding you know, the natural vegetation, um, the water, the drainage areas, do hydrologic modeling. But not only do hydrologic modeling, we also do groundwater modeling. So uh, we had a couple, um, because we had a, historic trees on the campus, there's a shallow aquifer that we knew about. And so we knew if they did this Coast Guard building, and all the other things that I can't talk about that were deep excavation, that potentially they were going to dewater um, because when you build deep and you have a shallow aquifer, you have to have pumps that drain, they're called foundation pumps, foundation drains, 
that take the water that you intercept because you're building deeply and then pump it usually to the sewer system, which is no good because um, what happens if you're constantly doing that over time, that shallow aquifer falls and then the trees that are used to water being here can't access the water um, that is deeper. So we wanted to understand what that elevation was of that, um, that, that groundwater system. So we had a couple uh, wells that did track the flow over time, over a year period. But you can imagine we can't have a, like a LIDAR data, we can't have that point every 13 centimeters of a well. Uh, so what you do is you sort of interpolate for those that have taken um, grading class, you take a few points of where you're finding that elevation and then you just sort of connect the dots basically below ground using GIS to understand where that aquifer system is. And so that's what we did here. You can see the monitoring well, um, and then you sort of explain graphically to the client um, how that system works. Uh, and then that then sort of informs uh, whoops, doing, um, at, depending on the, the deepness of the building that you're building, um, whether or not you know we're going to hit water, how much water we're going to get, and then you know, communicating to them the importance of pumping that water back up through the irrigation system, not through the system. Uh, and then you know that helps all with our stormwater management plan as well. So this was the Coast Guard building that we actually um, designed um, as a part of phase one of the master plan. This is just the earlier rendering that has 12 acres of green roofs. Um, and then that's what it looks like today um, on the green roof. These are all green roofs that you're looking at right here that manage stormwater um, and can provide habitat for deer even on the roof. <laughs> so I just wanted to quickly show you some project examples um, of how we use GIS in the office. You guys are going to be able to do all this stuff, <laughs> right? <laughs> you all have any questions and we'll take just a, a little bit of a break. Um, and before we take a break, maybe we'll make an announcement. Do you all have any questions? Yeah. Okay, so um, we, we've created a model that's based on um, data from other people's research that we use as the model that we build, and then we tweak the model based using handheld um, devices that track decibel levels. Um, we do not, it's a, a step up from using your iPhone on a couple hundred dollars. Uh, I can't remember the actual name of it, um, but I can, I can uh, it'll be a landscape architect and I can order to provide a little list of, of um, those devices. Uh, but we do field measurements and then we tweak the model based on those field measurements. It's average decibel level over a certain amount of time. So, what kind of noise is it? Um, noise can be often noise can be like noise. We're mostly focused on noise pollution. Um, so, we, there are there's data associated with whether it's two wing layers or four wing layers. Um, we also have gunshot as part of the soundscape. Uh, so the very rural, like there's a lot of subdivision development happening nearby, but there's also sort of the old school type of folks that are definitely still shooting their guns. And you can imagine being from the inner city of Austin and never being camping before, and then like coming to this weird place with and hearing all the gunshots. Uh, so that was a part of our novel as well, the site to camp away from us so it wouldn't be an easier experience and maybe a negative experience. Uh, but also transmission lines, electric lines have their own associated, um, maybe you don't perceive it directly, but it's a, you, you can perceive it, but you might not hear it. Um, like if you thought about it, you can hear it, but it is a question. Um, but there's research on different decibel levels. We didn't have a high transmission line associated. Um, that went through the property, so that had its own sound. And just like farm machinery, um, agricultural, the basic things we might do. And then just residents, residential development had its own soundscape that it puts out there, closing a garage door, closing a, a door, driving up and parking. You know, there are just soundscapes. There's research out there that sort of summarizes all of that and gives you sort of a, a guesstimate of what that is, and then you apply it to the, the typology of the Okay. So, what do you think? 
So I think we may have real. Okay. <laughs> 